Wikipedia has a page dedicated to a list of lists of philosophers. There have been so many philosophers around the world throughout time of all different styles of philosophy that they cannot all be contained to a single list page. Wikipedia needs a list of lists. And if you scroll down to the very bottom of that page, you find the list dedicated to female philosophers. That is how few female philosophers there have been throughout history around the world. In fact, prior to setting out to make this video, I don't think I could have named a single female philosopher prior to about the 1980s. Luckily, a few months back, my friend Riley suggested that we buddy read The Blazing World by Margaret Cavendish. This work was written in 1666, and it is one of the earliest examples of sci-fi that we have, it was published alongside a philosophical work by Cavendish. So thanks to Riley and this book, I can now name a female philosopher. And after this video, you will be able to as well. I actually first met Riley because they commented on one of my YouTube videos and we started working together on our PhDs, so I am very lucky to have Riley as a friend and I cannot wait for you to meet them as well. In this video, I sit down with Riley and we discuss Cavendish, her life, her philosophy, as well as her work, The Blazing World. I hope you enjoy. <laughs> Hi, Riley. Hi, Morgan. <laughs> Welcome to my YouTube channel. Thank you very much for having me. Today we're going to talk about The Blazing World by Margaret Cavendish. It was a very interesting read, so I can't wait to chat with you about it, but I figured before we get started, uh, you could introduce yourself to my audience. Since you haven't been here before, you've been lurking in the comment sections <laughs> up till now. So uh, why don't sure. you tell us a bit about yourself as a philosopher and as a reader of fiction? Yeah, so uh, my name is is Riley. Um, I'm a philosopher. I'm doing a PhD in ancient philosophy. So not early modern stuff. I do Plato. But that still means I find philosophy interesting also from other periods of time. And um, I like reading uh, mainly science fiction, fantasy, magical realism, and speculative fiction. Which basically meant that the blazing world was very, uh, very much up my alley and something that I was eager to read, anyways. Yes, it's kind of all of those things. So let's move on to Margaret Cavendish then. I'll give a little bit, I mean, sort of a history of her life, uh, the, th the parts that I find interesting about her life. And then I'll pass it off to you to talk about the philosophy because clearly that is your specialty, not mine. <laughs> So Margaret Cavendish was born Margaret Lucas. She was a philosopher, clearly, but also a poet and a writer and also a fan of fashion. She loved to dress up in really strange outfits for the time, and she loved making her own clothing. Sometimes she would even include elements of menswear in her outfits, which I think is just very cool, especially considering everything else she does. She became a maid of honor to Queen Henrietta Marie, despite being a very shy person around strangers. She ended up kind of disliking that job, but her mom didn't want her to disgrace herself or lose the income she was getting. So she said, you have to stay. And then about a year later, the queen went into exile and Cavendish was forced to follow her to France. So shortly after arriving there, she met William Cavendish, who was also in exile, and they got married. And their love just sounds lovely. He loved her for her mind, which must have been very fulfilling at the time. They remained in exile together for about 15 years, during which time Margaret wrote. And William assisted her writing through his many connections. He hosted even, for instance, regular meetings of the Cavendish Circle, which other philosophers attended. And he helped her get her books published, which was a, a big thing at the time. Like, that was an uncommon activity for women to publish books, particularly under their own name. Like, women were maybe publishing little pamphlets to hand out to their friends and family, or they were publishing under a pseudonym. But nope, Cavendish had fully bound books, like full length works of philosophy and fiction and poetry, uh, and even some like autobiography and biography of Cavendish. Uh, female writers and female philosophers didn't really have an audience at this time, so her work actually wasn't that well read in her time, which I find very sad, and other philosophers didn't really give much critical response to her. Some even suggested that William was the mind responsible for her thinking and writing, which 
she rejected those claims in her writings, just outright. I find it very sad that Cavendish's philosophy wasn't widely read at the time, partially because she had a great ambition for fame for her thinking, and it's very sad that she didn't get that when she desired it so deeply, but also because philosophy is a dialogue, and I can't imagine how disappointing it must have been to not get to participate fully in your craft of philosophy simply because you're a woman, and despite your absolute best efforts to be heard uh, in this field. So today we wanted to give Cavendish the credit that she deserves and discuss her work. And with that, I will pass it over to Riley to talk a bit about Cavendish's philosophy. Cavendish wrote in the early 17th century to mid 17th century. The book that uh, we read or the work that we read, The Blazing World, was published in 1666. Um, together with one of her major philosophical works. This was really like, they were published together. This was, the, the work of fiction was the second part of the work. So one part was philo uh, philosophy and the other part was the blazing world, which is also referred to sometimes as the first science fiction novel. And um, when looking at Cavendish philosophy, like Morgan already said, there was the Cavendish Circle, which had a bunch of important philosophers such as Thomas Hobbes, René Descartes, and Canon Digby. She would also go to that circle, so she was absolutely actively interacting with philosophers in her time. And um, her brother was actually educated by Thomas Hobbes, which also gave her access to a lot of those um, ideas. And of course, she also talked with her brother, so she was able to learn a lot in that way. So even though she didn't have a formal education in philosophy, she was able to learn a lot about it and still actively engage with it. As far as what kind of philosophy she does, she was specialized in uh, metaphysics. So uh, more like what are the building blocks of the world? What is matter? Um, yeah, like the really basic, how does the world work? How does motion work? Causality, things like that. That's one of the main things that she worked on. Her major idea is that everything in the universe, including human beings and their mind, is completely material. The fact that she thought that minds are material was um, not commonly accepted at the time. And she actually thought that this would be a great thing, like a very helpful idea, because if minds are material, that makes it much more easy to investigate them because we know from other fields how we can investigate matter and material things. Um, <laughs> one of the pieces of evidence that she brings forward for this is that people get hangry. So um, because we are affected by... <laughs> Because we are affected by uh, by our nutrition, and she says that um, material things can only interact with material things. It must be that our minds are material. And she also says that old age affects our cognitive function, which only can be the case if it's like something material that declines over time. Uh, one of the reasons she thinks this would be great is that it would mean that mental health uh, can be much more easily researched and worked on. Yeah, this idea that embracing the body is very important would also break with tradition because um, it was often, especially in more religious circles, said that the mind or the soul is the most important part and that we are bound to our body, which has kind of these negative desires and things like that. But Cavendish said that it was really important for us to embrace our body uh, because it is also a material thing and it is only in kind of the interaction between these two that we can really like understand the entire being. Another thing that's very interesting about her philosophy is her idea of causality which probably sounds wild to most people nowadays, specifically her idea of motion. She says that if I run one thing into another thing, you would think that it's the motion of the first object that causes the second object to move. What she says is no, 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 because all bodies are like intelligent in her idea. So what bodies actually do is communicate with each other. And this is how they communicate their behavior. So the first body prompts the second body, and then the second body is like, yes, I do want to move, and then moves. This is obviously a bit simplified. I am not um, an early modern 
philosophy scholar, but this is broadly speaking what her idea is. Um, and then finally, she had an idea about um, like the divine, because people would obviously ask her whether God existed or other divine things. And she says that, yeah, it is possible that they exist, but if um, either God is material and we can interact with him, but if God is not material, then we can't interact with him or actually know of his presence of anything like that. So she doesn't outright deny that there is such an idea of a Christian God, but if this is Christian God is immaterial, then there is no way for us to interact with him in any way. Yeah, so she has a really interesting uh, philosophy with a bunch of very interesting ideas. And it was also nice to see that a bunch of these ideas actually make their way into our fiction. I agree. It's it's amazing. I really can't wait to dig into like talking about the book itself because so so many of these ideas that I didn't know she had at the beginning of the book, I discovered through reading the f- work of fiction, like what her actual philosophical stances were. So this is not like strictly a fiction. Um, it's also a work of philosophy in itself. And then learning more about her philosophy, I understood the book better. So they really mm-hmm. feed into each other, which is so cool. Why don't we start talking about the book just by giving like a basic summary of what happens, if that is possible? Yes. Yeah, so what what the hell happened? <laughs> yeah. It starts very strong with um, a merchant stealing away this lady and um, trying to kidnap her on a boat. Mm-hmm. But then they get a little too close to a pole. Not just one pole, because if apparently there are multiple worlds, and if you get too close to one world, you end up in another one because there was a gateway there. And it's very, very cold there because if two poles meet, it is double the amount of coldness. So, yes, yeah, all the other men on the ship die. Yeah. And um, they got too cold because also they were cold hearted. They're trying to kidnap a woman, they deserved to die by the cold. But her, yeah. she survived by the light of her beauty and the heat of her youth. So she ended up in another world, aka yes. the blazing world. And in this blazing world, she meets all sorts of new types of beings. They tend to be named after animals, which I actually found super interesting considering her idea that all matter is like conscious and intelligent and then she kind of like confirms that with her reader by um populating this world with animals which i mean even still today we don't consider to be as intelligent as people but she actually uses these animals as like other scientific and philosophical thinkers in this space i think i actually have flagged the list of types of animals that she discovers there if you want to hear yes definitely him <laughs> As I have already made mention heretofore, some were bear men, some were men, some fish or mere men, otherwise called sirens, some bird men, some fly men, some ant men, some geese men, some spider men, some lice men, some fox men, some ape men, some jackdaw men, some magpie men, some parrot men, some satyrs, some giants, and many more, which I cannot all remember. I mean, fair enough that she can't remember them all. There's a lot of animals in the world. And if all of the animals are now men in the blazing world, we don't even have names for all the animals. No. Another thing that I found interesting when she first entered this world was a quote that goes like this. She met all of these strange men and she endeavored to learn their language, which after she had obtained so far that partly by some words and signs she was able to apprehend their meaning, she was so far from being afraid of them and that she thought herself not only safe, but very happy in their company. So when she arrives, she actually goes and tries to learn the language of these people and tries to like deeply understand their world. Mm -hmm. And this was kind of a common theme throughout that in the blazing world, as opposed to her world or our world, which does come up later, um, there is only one language, there is only one religion, there is only one leader, and there are very few laws. And she says that this means everyone's quite happy and agreeable, and there's very little division in this Mm -hmm. world. So this is like a utopia. She literally later says the blazing world is paradise. Yes. 
That one came out of left field for me, but yes. <laughs> and I think specifically the paradise that Adam and Eve were born into. Yes. But we can we can go back to that later. So she she goes to this this place and uh with with all the, the bearmen and the foxmen and the geesemen and so on. And um then she goes to the court there. She's like, yes, I, I do like I, I do like the idea that there is monarchy here. I would like to participate in the monarchy as being one of the monarchs. And, and the emperor is fine with that. The emperor is like, And yes, apparently please. they're all like, yeah, great idea. Let's do that. Yeah, the emperor needed an empress. <laughs> done. You're in. Yeah. You now rule the world. <laughs> you don't know the world yet, but you're going to rule it. Mm -hmm. And then she sets out to know that world. That is her main task, it seems like. Yes. And she spends quite a while doing that. She she basically asks all the different kind of animal men who have different specialties and different like disciplines. So there are some that do chemistry, some that do mathematics, and so on. She basically wants to talk to all of them and learn what they have learned about the world. And um, she also interacts with them as kind of like, well, but how do you know that? And why should we think of it like that? So she really... Goes full philosophy on them, and she's that's like, how she she's learns like a little more about child. She's like, why? Oh yeah, but why? why? But yeah, why? Why? Why though? She's to like, be fair, that is basically a philosopher's job to be a six-year-old. <laughs> uh, my my personal favorite example of some of the questioning, like the lines of questioning she's going after here, um, is that she asks whether all creation is created in the form of its producer so like if all offspring mm -hmm. is in the form of their you know parent and she's told well not really because if you take the example of insects maggots come from cheese but maggots are different than cheese and cavendish which i love her for is like well maggots are kind of like cheese though they kind of taste like cheese and mm -hmm. they have no blood like cheese and then the animal men that found this information for her are like, yeah, but maggots are self-moving. And she's like, well, if the maggots ate all the cheese, the cheese would be self-moving too. <laughs> it's also an example of how all of her philosophy like weaves back into her fiction and her ideas mm -hmm. about the world that like, mm -hmm. no, cheese is also intelligent and conscious. And like, yes, of course obviously. it is. Yeah. <laughs> She, she also is kind of questioning science and philosophy of the time through these lines of questioning because she says things like, well, you know, microscopes are limited. This is a time when um, scientific tools are kind of emerging. And she says, yeah. well, these scientific tools are very limited in scope. Like we can't know the world through these tools alone because, for instance, mm -hmm. I can only look at the surface of an object with a microscope. I can't see what's inside it. Yeah, I mean, definitely in this time, there is a lot of more experimental philosophy happening so people doing actual experiments to find out how things work but we're still in the 17th century like we don't have that many tools and not that much equipment to actually figure out how the world works and even nowadays like we don't know how everything works so she kind of in some way pushes back against the idea that if it does, if we can't confirm it by experiments or by microscopes or something scientific like that, we have to throw it out of the window. Because if we would do that, we wouldn't be left with a whole lot of things. So um, also her philosophy is kind of trying to explain the whole world and all its different aspects. And the ideas are supposed to cover all of everything, basically. So they're really more more fundamental than the things that we can look at with microscopes and things. Yeah, she says that nature is but one infinite self-moving body. Yes. She's, she's looking at the big picture here. The very big picture. Anyway, we can continue with the summary now. At some point, she she des I think she decides she wants a companion. Um, a scribe. So then she's like, I do want to write stuff down in a fancy way, but I don't want to write it down myself. I want to have a scribe who writes this down for me. So get me a scribe 
And then she suggests a couple examples. She's like, maybe an ancient philosopher. And they're like, they won't have the patience to do this, like Aristotle, you know? And then she's like, okay, well, maybe a modern writer like Descartes or Hobbes. And then the spirits literally tell her that those men were so self-conceited that they would scorn to be scribes to a woman. So So eventually they're like, we have an idea. There is this person, Margaret Lucas Cavendish. She would be perfect for the job. She lives in another world, though. So this is a third world. We're now up to three worlds. Yes, this is when Margaret Lucas Cavendish enters her own story. So it's something like the soul of Cavendish enters into kind of like the soul of the Empress. They're in dialogue in spirit, somehow. She can't yes. material materially enter this world. There's no way for Margaret Cavendish to mate- like her material body to go into this world, but somehow her spirit or her soul, I'm not sure the difference enters the world. And Cavendish and the Empress become very good friends. They they listen to each other. They they, they, they enter... are very intimate. Yes, they because they dialogue. literally share the same body. Exactly, they become like best girlfriends, <clears throat> uh, which is sad to me because Cavendish didn't have real like philosopher partners to bounce ideas off so she just invented one in the form of the empress and so these women get along very well and you know they they come up with lots of ideas together they're going to help each other in their own worlds like the empress's original world and cavendish's Mm -hmm. world because her husband has um fallen out of favor with fortune yeah so the empress and and cavendish are having a great time and then they want to Basically, they're like, well, our, the world that we came from kind of sucks. Maybe we should just make our own. I actually have a list of all the things that the Empress thinks is horrible about our world, aka Cavendish's world, which I thought was hilarious. In our world, unlike in the Blazing World, um, there are many several nations, governments, laws, religions, opinions, etc. And she thought that the, it was incredible that they should actually all agree on a few things. And they all agree in being ambitious, proud, self-conceited, vain, prodigal, deceitful, envious, malicious, unjust, revengeful, irreligious, factious, etc. So she does not think very highly of our world. So they, they set about making their own worlds. Yeah, like we're, we're just going to make our own world. And um, they try to figure out, okay, so we want to make a new world. Whose philosophical ideas should we follow? So that they're going to start at the beginning of philosophy with the first philosopher, Thales. She says, And at first she resolved to frame it according to the opinion of Thales, but she found herself so much troubled with demons that they would not suffer her to make her own will, but forced her to obey their orders and commands, which she, being unwilling to do, left off making a world that way. And then she continues to the next philosopher, Pythagoras, which doesn't work out. Then Plato, which doesn't work out. So she moves on to Epicurus, also does not work out. She tries Aristotle, which is also a fail. Descartes, who she actually knew in person, but apparently his ideas also don't work. And then finally Hobbes also does not work out. So Hobbes is one of the people that she learned from. So we're talking about contemporary to her. So she has literally gone through the entire history of philosophy. All of their ideas are crap. You can't make a world like that. Then they do it according to um, to Cavendish's philosophy. It works. They make, they make a world. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very funny how severe she is in her criticisms of other philosophers and even still living philosophers that could very well read her work. She does not hold back. She never apologizes for anything that she does, for her ambition, for her criticisms of others. Like And she you also see this in her philosophical works. At some point she just flat out says that minds are material. And there were other philosophers that thought this, such as Locke, but Locke never like backs down and full out says this. Like you can you can see that he thinks this but no, Cavendish just says it. She's like, this is what I think. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's so empowering as an academic. And it's also empowering that her solution to her struggles in life is to create her own worlds. Yeah. Because we all have the opportunity, she says, to build our own worlds. 
She says, yeah. I hope that you don't fault me for doing this because you could all do it too. Like all of us have the opportunity to invent our own worlds of fancy that we could live in and be the kings yes. of. But that's the that's the world that you can come up with. There are, of course, also the three worlds that still exist. She she is like, okay, but can we also try to fix at least one of them? Well, I mean, the blazing world is already pretty good, but can we fix one of the other ones? So the way that she goes to like save the world that she came from, the Empress, she goes under water, first of all. She gets her, you know, fishmen to they make, make a submarine. submarine. Yeah. Yeah. And they travel back to her world. In short, they destroy everyone that is not a part of her original nation, which I found odd that her she resorted to violence. But what I found interesting is that she brought a bunch of technology from the blazing world into her old world, technology that they didn't have and didn't understand. For instance, there's something I think called a fire stone, which would it was a stone that would burst into flames if water touched it. And so she uses this to make it seem like she's surrounded by fire, which to them seems mystical, and maybe she's a sorceress of some kind. But for her, it's essentially science. But then what she does later with it is that she's like, I'm going to destroy everything and everyone. So which, um, she has her, I think her war, uh, worm men go to all different houses and put these fire stones in the houses. And then when it rains, the, 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 the houses start to burn. And of course, the people try to extinguish the fire. They put water on it, which just makes it burn more. So these entire villages burn down. And they're like, okay, we're done here now. Let's go back home. All of the princes from that world want to marry her. So she says goodbye to each one of them independently and then leaves. And that's and kind that's of that. the end. That's kind of, <laughs> that's really, I mean, she goes back. To the blazing yeah. world, Cavendish goes back to her husband, who she loves very much, which was so sweet. Because even in the fiction, Cavendish just loves her husband to pieces and wants to be with him. She promises to write some plays for the blazing world, because even though people in her world like the wrong kind of plays and won't publish her plays, the people in the blazing world will like her plays because they're good plays. There's something really sad about the fact that she basically wrote a fairy tale in which she is validated. She re literally just created an entire world so people would actually have this kind of dialogue with her in this fantasy world. And people would be interested in her works in this fantasy world. And people would be friends with her in this fantasy world. So that's the summary. Maybe now we could talk a bit about like the writing style. I was quite thrown off at first. Uh, it yeah. was very different from anything I had encountered. Um, a lot of the pages have no paragraph breaks at all, and some of the pages have no sentence breaks at all. So it's just one long running sentence. Fun fact, I didn't notice the sentence breaks not existing. I have read too much, too much obscure philosophy, apparently. This is also said in the introduction that Cavendish is rebellious in every way. Like, she doesn't follow style either she just does her own thing and it, it seems like she kind of thinks that the rules of language or logic uh will just slow her down in a way she should rely on her own natural ability to communicate these things which i mean feeds into the fact that she used fiction to talk about her philosophy and poetry there's also something about an idea of not belonging with the other people it feels like like she doesn't want to follow the rules that everyone else does their things by because they don't, I mean, in some way, they don't accept her writing anyway. So why should she try to write it following these strict rules? But yeah. she probably also, I don't know to which degree she knew all the formal rules because, of course, she didn't have the education that other people had, but it's pretty clear that at least to a degree, these are conscious choices, that she's just doing her own thing. There is one quote on page 184. Um, the Empress asks what Cavendish, so the Duchess, wants. And this is the response. Well, said the Duchess, setting aside this dispute, my ambition is that I would fain be as you are, that is, 
an empress of a world. And I shall never be at quiet until I be one. That's the Duchess speaking. That is Cavendish. This is Cavendish. Yeah, Cavendish says, I want to rule the world. And then in the epilogue to the reader, so we're we're back into nonfiction now. She's speaking directly to us as the author. Mm -hmm. She says, by this poetical description, you may perceive that my ambition is not only to be empress, but authoress of a whole world. So she does not only want to rule the world, she also wants to create that world uh, in a way that is different from the world the way the world is run now. And, and in some way, with her philosophical world, she, I mean, with her philosophical work, she basically aims to describe how the entire world works. So in some way, she is the author because she has written down the entire world. Mm -hmm. And that's within each of our capabilities as well. She yeah. lists all of these uh, powerful people in her epilogue and then says, no, I chose rather the figure of honest Margaret Newcastle, which now I would not change for all this terrestrial world. And if any should like the world I have made and be willing to be my subjects, they may imagine themselves such. And they are such, I mean, in their minds, fancies or imaginations. But if they cannot endure to be subjects, they may create worlds of their own and govern themselves as they please. Oh, that's so wonderful. That she yeah. literally, she knows, she knows that um, her voice is not heard in this mm -hmm. particular world. Um, and she says, even still, I would be nobody but myself. Like she's so self-confident. She knows that her ideas are good. She knows that they deserve to be read and she's not going to apologize for them and she's not going to put somebody else's name on them. And if other people suggest somebody else wrote it, she will reject those claims like vocally. And she notes that like everyone else can do these things too. Like it is within your power. Like there's no reason yep. for you to sit in silence and sadness uh, and just like mope about your situation. Just get it. Just, just go out and get it. You want to be yep. a writer? Be a writer. It's possible. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing is also that women in her time were not a fan of her either. Because she she doesn't do the woman thing correctly either. She also says that she doesn't want to do the typical romance thing in her fiction. And she doesn't want to dress like the women. And she just wants to be a woman in her own way. Yeah, totally. Well, thanks so much for coming onto my channel to chat with me about this book. And thanks for recommending this book. Like, I did not know about Margaret Cavendish before you suggested this text to read together. And I'm really glad you did because she is so super cool. And now I'm going to bring her up in every conversation I have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, even in philosophy, she's not a super popular figure because she is not really a central part of this conversation. So even though she anticipates a lot of very important philosophical views, She's not a big part of the canon, so she's often skipped, even though she has so many interesting ideas. And yeah, it's yeah. it's nice to pay a little bit of attention to someone like Cavendish. Thank you again, Riley, for recording that video with me. It was an absolute blast to record. I love to take a deeper look into the fiction that I am reading. If any of you watching have other book recommendations for us, please feel free to put them in the comments section below. I have a running list in my Obsidian of all of the recommendations my subscribers have given me over time, so I'm sure that I'll get to them eventually. Thank you for watching, and until next time, happy reading.